In the icy expanse of the Arctic, geologist Hybert and his team were conducting research, but just as their machines were running, a piercing alarm suddenly rang out. Moments later, the ground trembled, and large chunks of ice broke off, plunging into the water. Realizing something was wrong, Hybert immediately decided to return to the base. Before they could react, the ice cracked violently, swallowing a team member who couldn't escape in time. Soon, the computer delivered the latest data. When Hybert opened it, a chill ran from his feet straight to his head. NOAA's ocean monitoring system detected that the tectonic plates on both the east and west coasts of the United States had fractured. This meant that the entire North American continent could be submerged underwater. Hearing this, team member Michelle gasped in shock. However, the situation was far too serious for them to draw conclusions prematurely, so they returned to the base to carefully analyze the data. Still, Hybert knew that a disaster was very likely imminent. He contacted his wife in advance, explained the situation, and urged her to take their daughter and evacuate as soon as possible. Realizing the gravity of the situation, his wife quickly called their daughter out of the room and decided to flee to higher ground in Denver. At the same time, Michelle connected to Noah via video call. Hybert hurriedly sent all their data to Noah, emphasizing the analysis. The Arctic glaciers had sunk into the water due to seismic activity, causing a dramatic rise in sea levels, combined with the fracture of the U.S. coastal plates. This would trigger an unprecedented mega-tsunami. It was estimated that in 48 hours, the entire North American continent would be underwater. Before he could finish, a general received an urgent call. Coastal cities had already been struck by tsunamis, towering waves, blotting out the sky were mercilessly destroying everything in their path. The general dared not hesitate and immediately ordered the National Guard to assist residents in evacuating inland. Meanwhile, Dr. Ruth seized the opportunity to suggest that Hybert return to help devise a solution, as he understood the origins of the disaster. While they were discussing, a nationwide earthquake suddenly erupted. The Washington headquarters was relatively unharmed, but the research station was left in ruins. Even the exit was blocked by debris. Hybert grabbed a ladder, intending to escape with Michelle through the top. Unfortunately, another tremor struck, causing Michelle to sprain her ankle. Realizing she couldn't move easily, she chose to stay behind at the research station to provide Hybert with real-time data. With no other choice and billions of lives on the line, Hybert reluctantly gathered his belongings and boarded the rescue helicopter. At that moment, there were 47 hours left until the U.S. would be submerged. Hybert rushed to Washington as quickly as possible to work with Dr. Ruth on analyzing the data. Ruth discovered that the Arctic glacier collapse had disrupted the Earth's magnetic field, making the earthquakes and tsunamis far more severe than usual. Hearing this, Hybert had an idea. They could dig large-scale sinkholes at key points across the nation. This would absorb water while relieving the geological stress caused by plate movements. However, Ruth immediately rejected the plan, stating they no longer had time to implement such a massive project. At that moment, Michelle delivered more bad news. She detected that the magnetic field changes were caused by increased solar radiation. This gave Ruth and Hybert a new idea. They could use the solar radiation to evaporate the glaciers, which would lower ocean levels. Coincidentally, the general, who oversaw weapons research, had already developed a sonic weapon capable of destroying glaciers. The weapon could also use EMP pulses to stabilize the magnetic field. Although this solution was temporary and couldn't stop plate activity, it was their best option under the circumstances. The two immediately presented their idea to the advisor, who, uncertain, reported it to the general and the president. However, alarms suddenly blared throughout the building. The tsunami had already reached Washington, against the massive, towering waves. The White House looked like a mere toy. A military officer, Pierce, rushed in to remind them to evacuate immediately, but all the critical data was on the computer without it. They would have no way to counter the disaster. Pierce decided to accompany Hybert and Ruth to retrieve the computer. By then, the floodwaters had already reached the lower floors. The three grabbed the computer and hurried to the rooftop. The helicopter lifted off just in time, narrowly avoiding the disaster. Looking down at the flooded Washington, Hybert and the others felt a mix of emotions. None of them had imagined the disaster would come so quickly and so terrifyingly. Shortly after, the group arrived at the aircraft carrier fleet, where the general was waiting. He decided to proceed with Ruth's plan, deploying all sonic weapons to the Arctic. The president agreed, and a large force of soldiers was dispatched to the Arctic. Under Michelle's guidance, the weapons were deployed. Once everything was ready, 
the lieutenant handed Michelle a pair of protective goggles and ordered the weapons to fire. All the sonic weapons were launched simultaneously, illuminating the glaciers with a blinding light. In reality, there are five types of sonic weapons. Infrasound, strong sound waves, ultrasound, noise waves, and rapid sound pulse waves. Some cause blurred vision and unconsciousness, while others can even be fatal. As a result, sonic weapons are becoming powerful forces on the battlefield. Hundreds of miles away, the general and his team closely monitored the changes in the Arctic. The glaciers began to disappear gradually. After the first round of fire, the captain excitedly reported to the general that the entire glacier had vanished, and ocean levels remained unchanged. Everyone sighed with relief. Though many towns were already submerged, it would take time to restore life to how it once was. Just as everyone thought the disaster was over, Michelle analyzed the data and turned pale. She delivered even worse news, the weapons had not repaired the magnetic field. Instead, the magnetic field shifted unpredictably, triggering even more frequent crustal activity. As she spoke, the ice began to tremble. Michelle looked up and saw a towering tsunami rushing toward them. Hybert panicked, urging Michelle to flee to safety. But Michelle knew that if she left, all the precious Arctic data would be lost, and they would never find a solution to stop the disaster. She chose to stay behind to transmit the data to Hybert. Amid the chaos, helicopters began taking off one by one. Soon, only Michelle's and the lieutenant's helicopter remained. The lieutenant repeatedly urged Michelle to leave, saying the data could still be transmitted from the helicopter. Even the general personally pleaded with her over the radio. However, Michelle worried that moving might disrupt the network connection and refused the general's evacuation order. Seeing her firm resolve and the tsunami approaching rapidly, Lieutenant could only shake his head helplessly and leave. But the tsunami had already reached the glacier. The helicopter instantly lost control and plunged straight into the water. At the same time, the data upload was successful, and the surging giant wave roared in, swallowing Michelle in the blink of an eye. A heavy atmosphere spread across the command center. No one had expected Michelle to die in such a heroic and tragic way. From the data she sent, it was clear that even destroying the glacier wouldn't fix the magnetic field. Had the submersion of America been inevitable? The general, unwilling to sit idly by, approached Hybert and urged him to think of another way to make Michelle's sacrifice meaningful. However, what Hybert didn't know was that his wife and daughter were also in trouble. They had just reached the mountain area when they realized their car was running out of fuel. Fortunately, they spotted an abandoned car by the roadside. In the face of disaster, his wife threw aside any legal concerns. She used a hose and a bucket to siphon gasoline from the car's tank. But moments later, their daughter noticed a tsunami rising in the desert in the distance. The apocalyptic sight sent shivers down her spine. She quickly grabbed the bucket to fuel the car and, together with her mother, set off to escape. Meanwhile, back in the command center, everyone was brainstorming. They thought of many ideas, but none of them seemed feasible. Finally, Hybert spoke slowly and brought up his sinkhole plan once again. He had identified 15 critical points across North America. If they dug deep, 16-kilometer holes at these points, they could drain the floodwaters and cool the tectonic plates, stopping the tsunamis and earthquakes. But with only 24 hours left before America submerged, even if the plan were feasible, how could they dig such deep holes in a single day? Just as everyone was at their wit's end, the general exchanged a look with Pierce. They both realized this was no time to hide anything. The general brought up a secret military project from a few years ago an experimental device called Mole. It could drill at lightning speed and trigger explosions, but because it was controlled over the network, it was vulnerable to hacking, so the project was shelved. Unexpectedly, this abandoned plan had now become the key to saving America. The general and the advisors immediately authorized the operation. Pierce quickly inquired about the location of the mole. He learned that the facility was only minimally affected by the floods and could still launch the device. To create the deep hole required for Hybert's plan, they would also need a large supply of gel explosives. Pierce ordered his men to transport the explosives to the mole base. While he, Hybert, and Ruth set off to meet them, soon, they saw a convoy transporting the explosives. But before Pierce could relax, a dark flood suddenly erupted from the ground, forming a powerful whirlpool. Two escort vehicles couldn't avoid it and were instantly swallowed. Only the truck carrying the gel explosives managed to hold on. Seeing this, Pierce immediately ordered the helicopter to descend. He threw a rope down, and two soldiers helped to pull the boxes of explosives up to the helicopter. Ruth felt a chill as she looked at the gel, glowing with a silvery green light. The success of their mission now depended on it. After continuous teamwork, 
They managed to retrieve all the gel explosives. Pierce then dropped the soft ladder and led the soldiers away from the danger. Not long after, they reached the Mole Research Base. However, due to the worsening disaster, communications were severely disrupted, and they lost contact with headquarters. Only the general could control the launch of the Mole. Pierce decided to head to the control room. He planned to use the system to guide the electrical power and satellite communications in an attempt to reconnect with the general. Hybert and Ruth set up a temporary control station outside to avoid having the building collapse in the event of another earthquake. Pierce entered the base alone, entered the password, and switched off the power. Using the satellite communication system, he successfully contacted the general. However, before he could report, another powerful earthquake hit, and rubble and debris fell, knocking Pierce unconscious. Outside, Hybert and Ruth hadn't heard any updates from the intercom for a long time. They went into the control room and found Pierce buried beneath the debris. They quickly cleared the debris. And just then, the general's voice came through the intercom. Hybert put on the headset and explained the situation, but the general delivered bad news. The earthquake had damaged the uplink, and without accessing the mole, it was impossible to get precise coordinates. They needed to reconnect with the uplink as soon as possible. Hearing this, Hybert prepared to act. But just as they were about to leave, an emergency earthquake warning sounded, signaling that the next tremor could exceed magnitude 8. Before they could react, the entire control room began shaking. Ruth quickly grabbed Pierce and fled first. Hybert was trapped by debris but managed to hide under a table. With Ruth's help, he escaped to safety. At this moment, the two soldiers reported that they had loaded the gel explosives into all the moles. Pierce had fully regained consciousness and was ready to fix the uplink to help the general target the launch. He led the soldiers to the warehouse where the moles were stored and instructed Ruth to repair the system. Just as they finished, a much stronger earthquake hit. The ground caved in, and all the moles fell into the cracks. As the cracks widened, the two soldiers fell into the deep hole. Only Hybert managed to hold onto the edge, struggling to stay alive. Fortunately, Pierce acted quickly, pulling him and Ruth to safety. Before they could catch their breath, the ground shook again. Without thinking, Pierce pushed Hybert and Ruth away to safety, and he himself fell into the dark abyss. Though devastated, Hybert knew there was no time for sorrow. The entire base had been split in two by the bottomless chasm. The two returned to the control room and informed the general that the situation was worsening. Pierce and the mole had fallen into the ground, but the general replied that he had successfully logged in and made contact with 15 of the moles. However, to pinpoint their exact locations, they would have to manually input coordinates for each mole. This posed a problem for Ruth as they had no tools to reach the bottom of the pit. Hybert quickly realized that the helicopter was undamaged. The general had also mentioned they could be taught how to fly it. He warned that there were less than four hours left before North America would be completely submerged. This was their final opportunity. Without hesitation, the two rushed to the helicopter. Following the general's instructions, they activated the controls, and the helicopter took off. Flying along the chasm, Hybert saw the scattered moles. The terrain at the bottom of the pit was too complex to land, so he decided to descend alone and input the coordinates. Hybert secured the rope around his waist and slowly lowered himself to the ground. Without wasting a moment, he hurried to the first mole, and under Ruth's guidance, successfully activated it. In the next instant, the mole transformed into a streak of light, speeding towards the designated coordinates. Seeing this, Hybert was filled with hope and quickly ran towards the next mole. As he became more skilled at inputting coordinates, each mole, guided by his commands, flew off to its designated points, landing precisely on the marked locations. However, when the last mole took off, it unexpectedly collided with the helicopter's tail. The mole fell to the ground, losing its function, and the helicopter was on the verge of losing control. Ruth repeatedly called out to Hybert, urging him to leave with her. But Hybert was buried under debris. Seeing that he wasn't responding, Ruth, out of desperation, had no choice but to inform the general. Fourteen moles are activated. We should prepare to detonate the bombs. Before her words could finish, the fifteenth mole was reactivated and quickly flew toward its target. At the same time, Hybert's wife and daughter were approaching Denver, but at that critical moment, their car ran out of fuel again. They had no choice but to abandon it and start running toward the mountains. But the tsunami's speed far exceeded their expectations. The mother, utterly despairing, embraced her daughter, ready to face death. But then, miraculously, the raging waters suddenly calmed. All the moles had burrowed underground and detonated the bombs. The floodwaters found a new outlet, rushing down toward the deep pit. Seeing this, 
The general understood they had succeeded and signaled for Ruth to return as quickly as possible. However, after losing so many companions today, Ruth refused to abandon Hybert. Fortunately, Hybert had regained consciousness. He grabbed the radio and contacted Ruth. Ruth, in turn, piloted the helicopter and descended again, throwing him a rope. While waiting, Hybert saw Pierce's dog tags on the ground. He was overwhelmed with emotions as he struggled to his feet. He attached the rope to his waist and finally made it back to the helicopter. At that moment, the general delivered a piece of tremendous good news. The floodwaters were slowly receding, and there were no more earthquake warnings. They had survived this catastrophe. Soon after, shelters were set up across the United States to take in the homeless. Hybert's wife and daughter were resting there. Suddenly, they heard a familiar call. Looking up, they saw Hybert walking toward them. Quickly closing the distance, the three of them embraced tightly, celebrating their hard-earned reunion. Hybert introduced Ruth to his family. After all, without her legendary actions, there wouldn't have been such a perfect ending.